All right, so top 20 biggest failures or mistakes <laughs> using ultraviolet sterilization or UV sterilizers. You're gonna learn a lot from us today because we've made all kinds of mistakes. And this is one area where if you do it wrong, it's actually almost useless. So just don't do it at all. <laughs> However, if you do it right, there's all kinds of benefits. All right, so number one, a lot of people have a total misconception of what this thing is even gonna do. Yeah, so uh, don't make the mistake of not understanding what sterilization is and what this thing is actually doing. So I see it on the forums all the time. There's, will my UV sterilizer kill X? Will it kill X? And you know, you're not really killing anything. It's sterilizing it. Yeah. Sterilizing means that it's gonna stop the thing from reproducing. So what we're gonna do is use the UV sterilizer and the ultraviolet light to damage the DNA of this microscopic mm. organism just so it can't replicate itself any longer. Yeah. So if I can stop the reproductive cycle, I can actually bring the populations way, 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 way down. So it's not killing anything in most cases, it's just stopping it from reproducing and increasing the population in your tank. All right, so number two, a lot of people will get lost in this conversation as well. It's just the minutia and you miss the entire point. Yeah, so the mistake here is not understanding the difference between eradication and population control. And there's probably some degree of uh, expectation, level of expectation here where, you know, in the forums and groups, again, you see these, uh, you see people saying, uh, UV will not get rid of ick. It will not eradicate, you know, dinos and things like that. And it's, you know, it's true, but the population is down. Yeah, so that's 100% true. The statement of, the UV sterilizer will not eradicate all ick from the tank is 100% true. That will never ever happen. However, these things have life cycles. Yeah. So they live on the fish, they drop off into uh, the substrate, they reproduce, and then they go back in the water looking to hunt down uh, mm. other fish. Now, if we can dramatically reduce the population that are floating around trying to attack our fish, will dramatically reduce the amount of parasites on the fish that replicate in the whole life cycle and bring it way, 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 way down. Mm. So it is absolutely true you're not going to eradicate it, but really all I'm looking for is to bring it down to the population that it no longer affects the health of my fish or reduces the chances that it will overcome its immune system. And even things like uh, cyano mm. and uh, uh, diatoms and dinos, I'm actually not looking to eradicate uh, uh, yeah. dinos from the tank. I'm just trying to make sure that they're not overwhelming the tank in a population that affects the tank or even my enjoyment uh, visually with the tank. All right, so number three, I've heard this question now like maybe 2,000 times in the last year. There is a right answer to this. Yeah, so don't make the mistake of choosing to do two things poorly rather than one thing well, the UV sterilizer has a job it can do, two jobs specifically, and it's all based on flow rate. So I can either go after algae or I can go after bacteria and parasites. Yeah, so there's two different things that's happening here. So the parasites have like a pretty slow life cycle. So yeah. I actually don't only need to sterilize the water a handful of times, but they are generally a larger organisms. It's harder to sterilize, so the contact time needs to be high as right. well. Now, if I have something like bacteria, these things can replicate really, really, really fast. So mm -hmm. I have stuff like uh, dinos, you can see that, like overwhelm a whole tank every oh, single yeah. evening. Overnight, right? yeah. Yeah, so in that case, I actually need to process the water much faster. You know, in this case, uh, often like six times an hour, mm. right? Every 10 minutes, most of the water is going through this thing at a very low dose, but enough to sterilize the, the dinos and prevent them from replicating uh, at scale. Yeah, right? but if I set this thing up on my tank, and I expected to do both, I'm just doing them both poorly. You really would have to have super duper mega uh, <laughs> and to be able to do both. And in fact, most people wouldn't do that. And by say that it's out of the reach of most people uh, mm. to have something that large. Yeah. So really pick a path. I know it's hard, but pick, <laughs> if you're gonna have a single UV sterilizer, rather than have it do both of these things poorly, yeah. decide what I'm really trying to use it for. Am I trying to keep the tank uh, uh, free of pests like cyano and uh, dinos or limit the chances that this is going to overwhelm my tank? Or am I trying to do this for the health of my pets with uh, mm. the fish? Like reduce the chances that it's gonna overwhelm their immune system and keep them safe and healthy. Number four, 
most of the conversation on this one is correct. Mm. Yeah, so the mistake is assuming that this guy right here is the magic solution, the magic pill for your tank that will cure all sick fish. Yeah, so the common conversation out there is, uh, if you already have sick fish, mm. the UV sterilizer is not going to help them. Uh, I'd say it's mostly true. Yeah. Uh, and so it's already living on them. It's already overwhelmed them. If you can see it, and especially if you're not like a, an expert and you see it, then it's probably already overwhelmed the fish. Something like ick, maybe it can live quite a while. Something mm. like brook, it's probably too late. Mm. You're certainly not gonna be able to order this and get it to your house and installed in time that it would solve anything like right. that. Yeah, true. Most of those things are, are way, way, way too aggressive. But some of them, it is. So here's the thing. I would not consider the UV sterilizer as a current cure for the outbreak you already have, mm -mm. but it can be part of the preventative method to making sure you don't run into this again. All right, so number five is actually the inverse of this, and many people are actually wrong when they make those absolutes in the other direction. Mm. Yeah, so the mistake here is assuming that this UV sterilizer has no value at treating your sick fish. Now, like, like we said, you're managing populations, which is beneficial to the fish. Yeah, so that's the common phrase, is everybody says it'll have no value in treating your current outbreak. It's not true, mm. right? Specifically with things like uh, ick, yep. where you can actually, a lot of the fish will survive the ick for quite a while. And if you can catch it, you can actually reverse some of the effects here. Yeah. And that's because there's a life cycle again. So it's living on the surface. You can see all the little white specks, these little populations of ick. They drop off, they go down into the sand, they like repopulate to reproduce in the sand, and then even more of them are swimming around. Eventually, there's so many that it overwhelms the immune system of even the healthy fish. Yes. Right? However, what if we put the UV sterilizer on there, catch it in the middle of one of those phases, we drive the population way down, and now we're protecting the healthy fish, and we're even giving the fish that were already affected a chance. So once those fall off, mm. the new ones actually won't come back. Yeah. So we really need to think about it more intelligently. Managing the population of parasites in the tank will absolutely help even sick fish that are currently sick as long as you give them enough time. Number six, maybe you don't have space for one of these. Yeah, so don't make the mistake of not considering a UV sterilizer for periodic issues and putting it on your tank periodically when those issues arise. So uh, classic case, 750XXL, we had dinos, uh, a dino outbreak on it. We pulled one of these, uh, stuck it in the tank, and it helped solve the dinos. You know what? Actually, uh, it was part of the way that we solved it each and every time. Yes. And so one of the things is we didn't want to re-plumb the tank. There wasn't really room yeah. for a, a UV sterilizer in there. But what I could do is just take a hose and uh, feed it into the tank and then back out of it and do a little closed loop with it. Now, eventually, we actually got sick and tired of fighting the dinos <laughs> in the tank. And every time the UV was a solution to that problem, so we took apart the plumbing and plumbed it in yeah. permanently. But even if you can't help right now, right now you're just trying to solve a problem in your tank, you can actually put it in rapidly just by creating a closed loop, setting it next to the tank, mm -hmm. may not be really pretty, but it'll actually solve your problem. Number seven, maybe the number one question that uh, I see about UV. Yeah, I think so too. And so the mistake is worrying about copepods. And I see this question anytime we talk about a UV sterilizer and a UV sterilizer topic comes up, what about my copepods? Don't worry about them. Okay, so there's two things here. I don't think you could stop the population of these things are growing all over your tank. Yeah. I've seen tanks that were autoclaved and mysteriously they have copepods in them. <laughs> I don't even know where they come from. Yep. So I don't think you could prevent that uh, from populating your tank. The second piece, even if like say you had a refugium in your sump, mm -hmm. these things are designed to sterilize a microscopic creature like bacteria, yep. right? Yep. Or algae, a copepod, is a large organism with visible appendages. I, I can see it with my yeah. eyes. So yeah. the one that decides to come in here and like live in here for the next week probably isn't gonna make it. <laughs> uh, the one that floats right through is not gonna be a problem. In fact, your return pump is probably a way, way more dangerous uh, yeah. uh, event for the <laughs> copepod. So if you're worried about UV and copepods, you can just stop. Number eight, 
This is a question that comes right after that one. Yeah, so uh, don't make the mistake of worrying about your beneficial bacteria. Uh, like maybe when you first start the tank and I'm actively dosing, I wouldn't turn the sterilizer on, but this bacteria lives on the surfaces of the rock, on my substrate, and doesn't go into the water free flowing to where the UV sterilizer can sterilize it. Yeah, so we're talking about that bacteria that like, you know, consumes all of the ammonia and mm. the nitrite in the tank and keeps it safe for the aquarium, yeah. right? So this is gonna have like virtually no effect. So if you had said no effect on it, you're probably wrong, uh, but it's gonna have no meaningful impact right. on the way that your tank processes ammonia or any of those things. So I just wouldn't concern about it. Again, it lives on surfaces like rock and sand, mm -hmm. those types of bacteria. They're not living in the open water. Now I wouldn't turn it on again, like uh, when I just started start cycling my tank, not because it will prevent the cycle, just because it'll probably make it longer than I would like. All right, so number nine, something I actually learned pretty early on, I was lucky enough. Yeah, so the mistake here is missing the difference between commercial grade UV sterilizers and hobby grade, almost toy sterilizers. And Telltale's uh, difference here, size and price. Yeah, I mean, that is probably it, because they don't come small if they work, yeah. uh, in most <laughs> cases anyway. So here's the thing. I think this is the piece of the great UV debate, the biggest piece mm. actually, is most of the manufacturers out there don't actually want to solve your problem. Mm. What they want to do is sell you a $50 tool so they can make 50 bucks. Yeah, so the guys on the, uh, the forums and the groups that say, I tried UV and it didn't work. Maybe a lot of them have bought these hobby grade, almost toy-like ones. Not only the toy doesn't work, but it also doesn't tell you how to use it properly. True. There's yeah. very little information in how do you get the right tool for the right job, use the right way to solve the right thing. Right. So in this case, the commercial uh, uh, versions of these things are uh, bought and used by commercial mm. aquaculture, you know, koi breeders, all these things where uh, if it's not done right, they have massive uh, losses which affect the bottom line or yeah. even the health of the company. Yeah. So uh, they're doing it improperly, keeping the populations of parasites down. They're used uh, intelligently. And I think the biggest sign uh, of one is the amount of information they give you on how to use it to the goal. If they're giving mm -hmm. you information to the goal, they've at least asked you what it is you're trying to solve. Right. right? Yeah. And then give you information. If there's no information on there what you're trying to solve, they don't care, they just want your 50 bucks. All right, so number 10, I have been guilty of this one. Yeah, so don't make the mistake of just guessing at the flow of your UV sterilizers. You just said like the reputable, the commercial grade type UV sterilizers tell you exactly how to use it. And that comes with flow rates, you know, the bacterial and algae flow rates or the protozoan flow rates. So the flow rate is designed for two things. Mm. One, to give enough contact time to give the right UV dose to actually sterilize it. And two, mm. to process the water, all of the water, or virtually all of the water in the tank, X amount of times an hour right. to catch up with that uh, organism's like life cycle. So you actually need to pay attention. So I've looked at it and said, ah, I don't know. That looks like 400 gallons an hour. <laughs> That's not good enough. Uh, you actually need to measure it. So there's cool tools out there like the flow meters from mm -hmm. Apex. But most people, I would actually just go ahead and take the output of it and have it go into a bucket. And you can time how long yeah. it takes to fill a one gallon bucket. Do the math, times it by 60, and you'll figure out exactly how many gallons an hour it is. Maybe something you could check every six months or so as uh, to pump clocks. But do a little bit of effort to actually make sure that the amount of water going through it is tuned to your application. All right, number 11, publicly. Very, very publicly <laughs> made this one wrong uh, as well. Yeah, so the mistake that Ryan made was you know, the closed loop in the sump is not the same as a closed loop in the display tank. And we're trying to turn over as much of the display tank as possible, not as much as the sump. Really, I think you're trying to turn over all of the water yeah. in the tank, yeah. right? It's probably best done in the tank itself because typically the more tank water. will have more water than yeah. the sump. But a lot of times it's just easiest to suck some water out of the sump into the UV sterilizer and then back into the sump again. Mm -hmm. Just like technologically or space-wise, it's just easier to do. But what happens is you just keep reprocessing the same water in the sump and it is not the same thing. So doing a closed loop in the sump, not the same thing as a closed loop in the tank. Often one of the best places to put this is on your return pump. 
So all the water goes through mm -hmm. this. And one of the other places people like to put it, but probably shouldn't, is on the overflow. So don't put it on the overflow oh, yeah. because normally a lot of air bubbles will come down with it over time and then get clogged inside of this or often stuck in here if you don't install it right. Mm -hmm. Just not one of the best implementations. So there are ways you could do it in some, if you're really elaborate, in the sump, feeding from one area of the sump back into the return area. But I gotta tell you, there's a lot of ways you can screw it up. And really, it's better done on your return pump and doing a closed loop of all the water through the system and you'll get better, better results, at least more reliable or predictable. Number 12, I actually had never done this and I wasn't actually all that worried about it until Thomas Burton told me a story. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to learn that story. But the mistake is, do not turn on your UV sterilizer bulb when it's outside of the UV sterilizer body. All right, so a lot of these bulbs are like, uh, I don't know, 18, 25 watts, really never concerned me all that much. Yeah. I know you're not supposed to look into it. Uh, Thomas Burton told me he had a friend light it up outside of it and it gave him an instantaneous burn oh. and hurt his eyes, couldn't see for days. Ooh. Yeah, so uh, don't pull the bulb out and plug it in <laughs> and then look into it because it's gonna be super bad news. Another one that I've been guilty of more than once. I know better and I keep doing it. I'm gonna stop. Yeah, change your light bulbs, change your UV bulbs. So don't make the mistake of never changing them. Uh, they degrade over time, you know, they become less effective over time. Swap them out about once a year. Yeah, in fact, uh, probably 50% less. They don't work anymore. And it's again, right tool, right job, used mm -hmm. correctly, no longer works. Yeah. <laughs> Might as well just turn it off. So change out the bulbs. It's about every nine months to 12, uh, nine to 12 months. Mm -hmm. So once a year, make sure you change out the bulbs, you get the effectiveness back and make sure the tool is working properly. Number 14, yet again, another thing I've done. <laughs> I mean, I tried really hard in the 360. I think I've achieved it, yep. but it's a hard thing to do. Yeah, the mistake here is uh, installing them in hard to access areas because you think, look how long this you know, UV sterilizer is. That bulb is just as long and I have to get it out to change it or replace the quartz sleeve. Yeah, so you are going to have to uh, clean this uh, at some point mm -hmm. in time. They come with union zombs, so it's easy to remove. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is the part that a lot of people don't think about is if I don't want to totally disassemble it, the bulb is going to come out of here and it's going to have to come out uh, roughly two feet at the top. So, <laughs> and even if it's in uh, inside my sump, it's going to come two feet out the side. So make sure to install it in an area where at least you can remove the whole thing fairly easy right. or you can remove the bulb. Uh, in my case with the 360, we set it up so it's in the fish room and you can pull the bulb right at the top. And I was really careful to make sure that we don't put anything else on top of it, mm. uh, even feet higher, to make sure that we can do easy maintenance on it, which means that I'll actually change the bulb, <laughs> well, like I just said, uh, do it on time and make sure it's working properly. All right, so I've seen the RMA pile before, uh, and this is one of the more commonly returned items is for this reason. Yeah, the mistake is not planning for the size. I think we have measurements on the website and you, once you get this thing in your hands, it's hard to tell by pictures, but once you get it in your hands, you're like, holy crap, this thing's gotta fit somewhere. Mm -hmm. So you have to plan for it ahead of time for the specific reasons that we just said. And uh, like you said, you know, different uh, volumes of water, different size UV sterilizers for that uh, recirculation and contact time through there. The bigger tank you have, the bigger these get. Yeah, so this guy, uh, I can see pretty easy where I could put this just about anywhere. Uh, anywhere. Right? Uh, this one, probably no problem. But the next size up of this is actually about another foot long. All right, where does that guy go? Yeah. And how am I going to remove the bulb? Mm. So do make sure to think about where this is going and how you're going to incorporate it before you buy it because you're going to want to get the right one uh, that actually works in the environment that you have it to your best of your ability. All right, number 16. If you don't read instructions, this is going to happen to you. <laughs> Uh, don't install your UV sterilizer where air is gonna get trapped inside. It flows in from the bottom, comes out the top. So if I have it like this, it's just gonna go across the front and back down. If I have it like this, it'll probably fill up with water, but I wanna put it at an angle. Best installation, straight up and down. Yeah, so uh, there are any, a lot of different options will work. Uh, mm -hmm. Both the ones you just mentioned, but if I do it like this, a giant air bubble will get caught in here, there'll be a little trickle of water across the bottom and it will not work. 
It'll be a giant waste of money and time. Uh, if I pump the water in the top here, mm. uh, the same thing will happen. The water will trickle down the bottom, come out here, and uh, there's probably a way to plumb it that it will like uh, let some air out, uh, depending on how you do it. But in most cases, you're just gonna have a big air bubble caught here. Even if you do some elaborate plumbing, little tiny bubbles could get caught in here. It's just not the right way to do it. You wanna plumb in water in the bottom and have it come out the top, and that way we can get all the air bubbles out. So make sure that you're thinking about where's the air gonna go when you're installing it. Number 17, uh, read the instructions again. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, do a leak test. And don't forget to do a leak test. Don't make the mistake of leak test. And we're not talking like just the leak test, uh, not a leak test of your plumbing fittings here. It's the leak test inside the UV sterilizer to make sure water's not getting to that bowl. Yeah, so there's a little tube that goes, a quartz sleeve that goes inside, and there's some seals in there, and I've actually never had it leak, right. but uh, it could leak. And so what you're gonna do is before you put the bulb in, uh, the bulb's gonna go in right now on the top here, Make sure you're running it with the water. Let it run for a, a day or so, and then you put a t paper towel on the top. And if the thing is leaking, the paper towel will largely get wet, mm -hmm. and then you know there's probably a leak there. If it's dry, you can now put your bulb in there and know that it's done safely. This is just a really good tip in the instructions to make sure that uh, the thing has been assembled right, especially if this is the first time you've ever assembled one, yeah. and you wanna make sure you did it right. All right, number 18. I mean, the amount of failures I've done, you don't have to do it. <laughs> uh, don't make the mistake uh, again of not cleaning that quartz sleeve. So inside, you know, it's just like your aquarium glass here. It gets cloudy, it gets dirty, and it needs to be cleaned every once in a while. Maybe not so as often, but that quartz sleeve does need to be cleaned off. Now, there is light going through there. You think maybe it's gonna grow algae? No, this thing kills algae. Right. Uh, so it probably won't get covered in algae or anything alive in most cases, mm. but it can collect some kind of like crust on it from time to time, mm. like a precipitate, specif specifically if you have really high pH yeah. and maintain a really high level of uh, alkalinity in your tank. So pay attention to, uh, you know, when you change at the bulb, is it like uh, totally overwhelmed? So once a year, if it's totally overwhelmed, you may want to clean it out like every six months or so, or just when you're doing the bulb, it's a good time to do that as well. 19, big, big, big question. Tons of people ask this one. Uh, the mistake here is buying a UV sterilizer with a wiper on it. So the wiper goes in and out of your UV quartz sleeve and it's supposed to keep it clean for you. Yeah, so there's like a little rod on the outside that'll keep your quartz sleeve clean. And it works pretty decent on fresh water. <laughs> Not in salt water. So uh, imagine you're watching this because you are a reefer or a, at least a saltwater aquarium owner. Uh, and in that case, those types of things tend to rust and leak. Mm. So you do not want a wiper on your UV. Do not buy that one. Don't let anybody talk you into that because uh, ultimately you will be very disappointed with how it performs in the long run. So no wiper on reef UVs. Number 20, if you're thinking about it now, you should probably act. Yeah, so the mistake is not buying your UV day one. If you think that you're going to put it on there, do it up front, especially before you do your plumbing. Yeah, I mean, this is best in the installed when you're initially doing all of your plumbing. That right. is when you're going to incorporate it the intelligent way, mm -hmm. instead of like trying to uh, just make it work with what you have. Because in many cases, uh, with what you have, you're gonna have to cut quite a bit of it apart, which is uh, not only kind of painful to do, yeah. uh, but it also takes up a lot of work and you have to like figure out how to take care of the tank during that time while the PVC is drying. Yep. So the best thing is, if this is interesting to you and you would like to add this kind of redundancy and safety for your pets and avoid some of those issues that a lot of people run into with uh, cyano mm -hmm. and dinos or have the tool already hooked up so if you run into it, you can turn it on periodically. Well, do it up front because it's just gonna be a lot, lot easier. All right, so if there's only one thing you heard today, let it be this. Yeah, for me, it's understanding the difference between the commercial grade and the hobby grade ones. I've seen the hobby grade ones. I know there's good deals on them. I can get them for under 50 bucks, and they claim to do everything else that UV can do, but there is a right tool for the right job that's better than those hobby grade ones, and choosing it will make you a lot happier. All right, so for me, if there's only one thing that you hear, let it be this. We are talking about population control. We talk about UV. 
We're talking about keeping the amount of parasites or even pest organisms down so that we don't experience them in the uh, uh, health of our animals and the pets that we take care of, or even visually because the tank looks overwhelmed with uh, ugly bacterial issues. Mm. So it isn't about eradication. End that conversation of eradication. That's never going to happen. What can happen, though, is we can solve problems in the way that we want to, which means we can keep the pets healthy and we can visually enjoy the tank much more. All right, so one of the exciting things that's about to happen here is we've already started some brand new experiments on mm. flow rates and using UV on dry rock and cycling uh, brand new tanks. Not just cycling like ammonia, but trying to eliminate that ugly stage yeah. in the tank. So we're gonna find yeah. out a lot about that in the very near future. However, this is a continuation of some experiments that Randy already did. Uh, and so we're learning more all the time, but you can go back and check out those first set of experiments right here.